Let me start by thanking the organizers of this occasion. I've sat for a few minutes and I've been thoroughly moved. I've used the occasion to send a number of messages to my colleagues in Kenya that a powerful thing is going on in Uganda and that in the fullness of time we Kenyans and I hope East Africans must embrace what is happening in Uganda. <laughs> Corruption is something that we talk about. It is something that we complain about. It is something whose negative impact we recognize. It is something that even the corrupt acknowledge is a bad thing. But the irony and the tragedy at once is that those who engage in corruption love it. The tragedy at once is that those of us who do not engage in it directly accommodate it. Our levels of tolerance for corruption in Africa is amazing. A long time ago, a great Greek philosopher said that it is in the nature of man to hang the small thieves and to elect the great ones into public office. We do that in Uganda, we do that in Kenya, we do that in Tanzania, we do that in Africa. And that is why Africa remains the poorest continent on earth. I was this morning rereading a book which I commend to you, a book written by a young Zambian economist called Dambisa Moyo, the book called Dead Aid. And in the introduction in that book, there is a note which was found in the bodies of two young Guineans who died while trying to run away from Africa. Today, many young Africans are running away. Not so long ago, about four weeks to be exact, 300 young Africans drowned in the Mediterranean Sea in Lampedusa because they were running away from Africa. Not so long ago, about three weeks to be exact, another group of young Africans drowned next to the island of Malta because they were running away from Africa. When you look at Africa today, whether you are looking at Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Nigeria, or indeed any country in Africa, our richest men and women are the men and women who occupy public office. We live in a continent where we celebrate thieves and vilify good men and women. That is the tragedy of Africa. While every other continent in the recent past has moved in the right direction, Africa still remains in the words of Tony Blair, as the scar in the conscience of humanity. We live in a continent today where, as the young man has said, our young women upon attaining puberty cannot afford sanitary pads. But our public servants have iPads which they do not know how to use. We live in a continent today where our leaders who preside over our health sectors have no faith in the health sector. When they are sick and their families are sick, they run away to seek treatment in Germany, in France, in the United Kingdom, in South Africa and India. Even our health ministers don't have faith in our health department. We live in a country and countries today where 
far the political leadership have no faith in the education sector. They bring unto us what they call free primary education or universal primary education, but they can never dare take their children to those schools. We live in countries where we claim that agriculture is the backbone of our societies, but we do not use technology to produce crops. Africans are dying younger than they were dying 50 years ago. We live in a country where Africans will energetically seek to amend the Statute of Rome while there is war in Mali, while there is war in Mauritania, while there is no peace in Somalia, while there is no rest in Eritrea. Africa is a tragic continent. And I want to submit to you that corruption is the source of all these. For some reason, a reason that I do not understand, Africans still engage in primitive accumulation. Many Africans, particularly those in public service, will never rest until they have homes in different capitals in the world which they'll never live in. They have cars which they'll never drive. They have beds of gold which they never sleep on because they have no sleep anywhere. They buy food which they cannot eat because they long lost their appetites. We live in sad times. I had the privilege of serving as the director of the Kenyan Anti-Corruption Commission. But it would appear that I did not understand my brief well. Upon being appointed, I assumed that my mandate was to go out there and fight the corrupt. But the truth was that I was not supposed to fight corruption. I was supposed to appear to be fighting corruption. Immediately, me and my team tried to fight corruption. The parliamentarians in their wisdom and in my own view in their lack of wisdom used the occasion of the amendment of the law to disband the organization and to send myself and my four directors out of office. The history of anti-corruption crusaders in Africa is one and the same. Their mortality rate in office is very short. Before I was victimized, before my victimization, Nuhuri Badu before me had been victimized in Nigeria, before I was victimized, McCarthy had been victimized in South Africa and his scorpions disbanded. Before I was victimized, my equivalent in Malawi had been victimized. Before I had been victimized, my equivalent in Zambia had been victimized. It would appear that in Africa, if you serve your full term, it is because you have refused to fight corruption. So the question that we must ask here and now, in an occasion, on an occasion such as this, what must Africa do going forward? It gives me great joy that you Ugandans have moved from the drawing table and you have now chosen to go out there to do that which is right and good. You have chosen today through the commencement of the caravan to move from the comfort of hotels in Kampala to going to Karamoja land to going to Gulu, to going to Teso to going to Hoima, to going to Kasese to go into Mtukula, to go into all the corners of Uganda so that the conscience of Ugandans can be reawakened so that they may realize that corruption is a cancer that must not be allowed to grow. But I want to use this occasion to remind you that it's not going to be easy. The children of darkness, who are the perpetrators of corruption, have one advantage over the children of light. They are well organized. They are prepared to kill. They are prepared to do anything on earth to ensure that their ill-gotten wealth is retained and protected. I always say 
that those who want to fight corruption must go to the Bible. When they go to the Bible, they must read the book of Matthew or any of the Gospels and read about John the Baptist. When they read about that book, they must remember that John the Baptist was in the habit of telling a king called Herodias not to engage in an adulterous union with his brother's wife. And he said this so often to the irritation of the king. They must remember that during that time there was a dance. They must remember that there was a lady called Salome. And they must remember that after she danced so well, Salome asked for John the Baptist's head. And I want to remind you that that is the way it is for corruption fighters today. You are like John the Baptist telling the latter-day Herodias, you are corrupt, you are corrupt. You must remember that there are Salomes who will be looking for your head. The question is, are you prepared? If you are prepared, then I have nothing to fear because this country will be liberated. I want you to remember that now that Uganda has discovered oil, the history of oil throughout us, Africa has been a sad history. If you go to Nigeria, which is the fourth or the fifth leading producer of oil in Africa, the Nigerians do not have a good story to tell. Nigeria is a great country, but is famous for producing some of the greatest thieves that the world has ever known. You will go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the richest resource country in the world. And the Democratic Republic of Congo is famous of producing some of the biggest thieves that the world has never known. If you did not know, there once lived a Mobutu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. If you had any doubt, go to Angola with all its oil. It has one of the richest African women in the world. The daughter of the president, Isabel dos Santos, she claims to be a businesswoman, but the last time I checked, she was just a tenderpreneur. And you can go to different African countries. The tragedy of Africa is that Africans are in the business of canonizing thieves and demonizing its saints. The question is, you who are present in this assembly, what is it that we must do because corruption is alive and well in our communities? I know in Kenya, and I speak from experience one day, we arrested a cabinet minister for engaging in corruption. On the day that he was arrested, members of parliament from his ethnic group came to my office and said that my only claim to fame was that I was in the business of fish finishing their tribe. They say he is our thief. He is a thief, but he's ours. You should not arrest him. I have no doubt in Uganda, you may have thieves, but they are claimed by their communities. What are you going to do about it? I know that even here in Uganda, all sectors of the society are not spared. Even the Church of Christ is not spared. Even the mosques are not spared. Even the temples are not spared. So to the clergymen present in this assembly, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory, not only of God, but the expectations of the people of Uganda and indeed Africa. So on an occasion such as this, our duty is to re-energize ourselves. Not so long ago, two weeks to be exact, I was at a function of the African Union and they have now come up with a slogan saying Africa 2063. They are saying that if we'll have lost 50 years, let not this generation lose another 50 years. The question is, are we going to gain Africa by mere pronouncements or we must change ourselves? We must change our behavioral DNA so that we are no longer attracted to that which is good, bad and evil. The question is, are we ready? The question is, do we say with our mouth what do we, we do not believe in our hearts? 
The question is, are we going to wait for outsiders to tell us to do that which we ought to have done? The question is, are we prepared to sacrifice our lives for the, that which is good and right? The question is, beyond the comfort of Africana, are we going to roll up our sleeves and meet the poor and the desperate and the oppressed in Karamoja? The question is, are we ready? And if we are ready, we must do that which is good and right. You know, a friend of mine once told me that the African is a very strange being, and I agree. When you give an African the vote, which is an instrument of decision-making, how does he use the vote? He waits for some thief to give him 50 shillings or so, and then he votes in the direction pointed to him or her by that thief. Then he told me that when an African is given a vote, he is like he's given a blank check to go out into the showroom and buy for himself a Mercedes Benz. When he gets into the showroom, he buys a tuk-tuk. And when he gets home, he wants the tuk-tuk to behave like a Mercedes Benz. That is the tragedy of Africa. When we are given the opportunity to elect good men and women into public office, we elect them on the basis of the size and the depth of their pockets, or on the basis of their ethnic extraction. And when they have occupied public office, then we expect them to behave well. We are asked to elect a committee to determine the fair rules of hunting. Then we elect hyenas and we expect them to take care of the goats. That is the tragedy of Africa. So we who are assembled here this morning, this is not an idle occasion. This is not an occasion where we come here to dramatize our anger, which will then peter away. This must not be an occasion when we come here to complain about the ills that we have observed. This is not an occasion when we come here to complain about the things that irritate us. This is not an occasion for sorrows and lamentation. This is an occasion where we have come to re-energize ourselves. This is an occasion where we have come to warn ourselves of the dangers of corruption. This is an occasion, fellow Africans, when we must ask ourselves, why is it? that all civilization are ahead of us. I'm a practicing Christian and as I grow old, I become more spiritual. And I read the book of Matthews and I read the story in Matthews about a rich man, a businessman, whom the Bible records one day, he decided to go away. When he was going away, he took five talents and gave it to one of his workers. And he took two talents and gave to another worker. And the Bible goes on to say to one, he gave only one talent. And he says that he went away for a long time and he came back. When he came back, he went to the one to whom he had given five talents. And he said, Master, I've worked the five talents, and I now have ten. And the master said, Good work. And to the one that he had given two talents, he said, I've worked the two talents, and they are now four. And he said, Good work. And to the one that he had given one talent, he said, I knew you. You are in the business of reaping where you have not sown. And the master said, if you knew I was such a man, why did you not take it to those who are in the business of giving people interest that I may earn my entitlement? And then it finishes. And to those who do not have, even the little that they have, it shall be taken away and it shall be given to those who have. If you look at Africa today, how is it that our minerals are taken away from us? 
from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Our oil is taken away from us. Our agricultural products are taken away from us and they are given to those who have. If you look at us today, sitting in this assembly, if there was a miracle to say anything that is not produced in Africa disappear, all of us would be naked. Because the clothes that you wear, none of them are made in Uganda. Because the ties that you wear, none of them is made in Uganda. Even the underwear that you wear, none of it is made in Uganda. The question is, are we children of a lesser God? No, we are not. But we have allowed ourselves to be corrupted in our morals and in our ways. Our leaders steal from us and they keep money in Europe and America. They can't keep it in Africa. The question is, for how long shall we allow this to happen? That is why I'm very happy to join with you here today. On the occasion of remembering the launch of the Black Monday. Why is Black Monday an important thing? It is an important thing because we must remind ourselves on a daily basis all the holy books, whether it's the Christian Bible or the Muslim Quran or the Hindu Gita are unanimous in one thing, that corruption is a bad thing. They are unanimous in recognizing one thing, that if we want to liberate ourselves from the chains of suffering, we must do something about it. In Uganda, I know you don't love Kiswahili, but soon it's going to be the lingua franca of East Africa. We say, Mtaka chaufunguni sharti aina. If you want anything under the bed, you must bend. We want a good Uganda that is free of corruption. And I look forward to that day. I look forward to the day when my good friend Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, the president of Uganda, shall sit at the hills of Nakasero and say with one accord, corruption, where is thy sting? Corruption, where is thy sting? I look forward to the day when the prime minister of Uganda shall move over to Gulu and speaking to the people of Gulu say, corruption, where is thy power? I look forward to the day when the ministers of Uganda, when my friend Jim Uwes and others shall sit and stand wherever they need to sit and stand and say, corruption, where is thy thing? I look forward to the day when the members of parliament in Uganda, the director of election, the policemen, the health workers in Mulago, the hotel workers, the border border riders shall be able to say with one accord that corruption is a bad thing and they shall be able to say like the Catholics say to ask for forgiveness saying mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa and those days will come but they'll only come when you and me do that which is good and right and I have no doubt that we are doing that which is good and right. As I conclude, because conclude I must, a number of things come to my mind. I remember fondly Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And I remember that lady saying that when you walk into a dark room, and you find that there is darkness inside of the room. You don't complain about the darkness. You take a candle and light the candle and ask your neighbor to light a candle. And lo and behold, when all of us have lit the candle, the room will be consumed in light. Today, I have no doubt in my mind that we have come here to light a candle. And there is that candle that was represented by the caravan. It is moving into the length and breadth of Uganda. And before the politicians and the thieves in Uganda realize it, there will be so much light that there will be no place to hide in Uganda. I look forward to the day 
When the words of the late Chinua Chebe written in his book, Things Fall Apart, are no longer at ease and a man of the people shall no longer be true that the African is corrupt through and through. I look forward to the day when Africa shall not be a winner of the equivalent of Olympic medals in the wrong things such as corruption index indices as prepared by Transparency International. I look forward to the day when our government ministers will have smaller stomachs because they are not engaged in anti-corruption activities. I look forward to the day when we Ugandans and East Africans, Kenyans and Tanzanians and Burundians and Rwandese and Southern Sudanese and all of us in East Africa will be known for the right things. But let me tell you, having participated in the fight against corruption, I know a number of things. I know that good laws in and of themselves will not fight corruption. Because if it was just good laws, what is better than the Ten Commandments? But you and me know that we honor the Ten Commandments in breach. So we must have something, we must have a change of heart. The Catholics who are present in this room, who are Benedictine monks, must remember with me something that they say when you become a monk in the Benedictine order. We must have something which in Latin is called conversatio morum. A change of heart, a total change, a DNA transplant, a character transplant, so that our dominant instinct becomes the instinct to do that which is good and right. And I have no doubt that it can be done and that it will be done because if it is not done, we are done. Ladies and gentlemen, may God bless you.